And thank you everybody for joining me for another one of the Siemens online seminars. Today we're going to get a great opportunity to take a look at the long-awaited uh, new released Siemens 4-axis post for Mastercam. So for those of you that uh, may not be aware, we've uh, been working directly with Mastercam corporate to help develop some Siemens specific um, validated and proved out post processors. So we released, I think probably about a year ago now, we released the first three axis post processor, maybe a little longer than that. Um, and now we've just released the new four axis post. Um, coming up in the future, we want to expand this process. We're going to do a turning post and hopefully even get all the way up to a five axis post. So certainly the intention here is that, uh, you know, we, we can give the resellers and the users a great starting point from a post perspective. There's going to be cases where, you know, this may not be 100% fit. It might need to be tweaked a little bit, but I think it gives us all uh, a really solid starting point. Okay. So just give me one second here. I have uh, a gentleman, I think that's yep, running into a, a login issue. So let me just uh, respond back to him and we can continue on. Unfortunately, I had a feeling this might happen. All right. Good. So, um, to introduce myself again, or for those of you that may not have had a chance to listen to me before, my name is Chris Pollock. I am what we call the Virtual Technical Application Center Manager, um, or abbreviated for short, we call it VTAC. Um, and basically all that is, is it's a uh, program that we've put together that's driving Siemens-based content on social media, the internet, the web. So obviously like the webinars we're doing right now, but we're doing a lot of little how-to videos, trying to get more content onto YouTube, that kind of stuff. So you're going to see a lot more stuff coming out over the course of the next year that's um, being driven by um, this initiative, this, this VTAC initiative. So normally this is my, my chance to queue up and kind of prep you guys for some of the webinars that's coming in the future. Um, however, I, at this point we got IMTS coming in September, so we're all ramping up for that. So I wanted to take a chance to actually talk about something we're, we're doing at IMTS that I'm pretty excited about. So in trying to to get more uh, more awareness to what we're doing, not only with the virtual TAC, which I just mentioned, uh, but also our physical training center, which I've talked about in the past, and I'll give you the links in a second. Um, to promote that, we've actually created our own booth space at IMTS, and we're going to have basically a mock classroom set up. So I'm going to have some machine simulators, we're going to have some tables set up, presentation center, and I'm even bringing in a milling machine. And we're, we're going to present um, a series of eight different topics, um, and then we're going to run those over the course of the show, and we're going to do little half-hour training seminars. So one, obviously, it's going to be some pretty good content in there, so we're hoping that you know, people can come in and attend and spend a little bit of time with us, and they're going to learn um, some of these topics. Uh, but two, also they're going to get a chance to see some of the resources we have available for training. Uh, both based on the web or if you attend our in-person classes. So what they're going to look like is they're going to be half-hour blocks. We're going to do four segments a day, and these are the topics you see on the screen. So um, first day, we're going to kind of concentrate around conversational-based programming, shop mill, and we're going to be specific to milling in these because obviously I have a milling machine right there with me in the, in the booth. Um, so we're going to do some simple introduction to shop mill. We're going to get into a little more advanced topics, talk about the DXF converter. And then we're going to do a segment on part probing or probing and in part inspection through shop mill. Um, and then we're going to end that up at the end of that day, talking about trig help functionality and get into more advanced topics in shop mill. Day two is going to be a G-code day, so we're going to do an introduction to G-code, and then later that day we'll get into advanced G-code and using DXF, so kind of following the same format. Um, then from there we're going to get you're going to get into the probing topic like we did in Shop Mill, but now it'll be all G-code based, and then we're going to end up with an advanced topic. We're going to get into variable programming a little bit and kind of introduce everybody to some of the more complex and advanced sections of programming. 
So we're going to take those those the two day sequence and just keep rerunning it. So obviously Wednesday will be a redo of Monday's content, and then Thursday will be a redo of of Tuesday's content, and throughout. So if you guys are getting to the show uh, and you want to come by, stop by either just to say hi, or if you have a little bit of time and you want to set in, please come on down. You don't have to register; just show up for the time slot, and it's kind of a first come first serve scenario. So if the space is available, you can come hang out. We're going to do some live cutting demonstrations. We have all kinds of cool stuff set up. So that's, um, we're going to be East Hall. Our booth number is there in front of you. So that's what we got coming in uh, in September. So we're all real excited about it. And then additionally, obviously the webinar content is here. So for those of us that maybe are new to this the series, you can always get to whatever next webinar is coming up right on the CNC webinar link that you have in front of you. Or you can access all of the previously hosted webinars. So the recording like we're doing right now gets posted on the CNC for you website, and then you can go back and check that out. And then from the in-person training perspective, we have a training se seminar or a training um, lab out in Chicago, Illinois. We call it our TAC, our Technical Application Center. So if you use the CNC training link or you drive to that, this is where you can see all of the in-person instructor-led classes that we offer. And these are all complimentary. They're anywhere from three up to five-day courses. So if you're looking to get into, whether it be from basic entry-level content or you want to get into advanced topics, we have a whole range from simple two-axis milling all the way up to five-axis milling. We have turning. Um, we have a pretty well-staffed and set-up facility. By all means, check it out, and hopefully you can come in and, and work with us there. Okay, so today's topic specifically relates to the A28 and the 840 control. So the posts we were developing are pointed or directed at these two controls. So this post, if you have either of these products, you can be using this post for it. So really what we want to do today is I want to show you the kind of the new features and functions we've incorporated in this post um, that kind of makes it a little different than the three axis posts we've already uh, we already released. So we're going to talk about, talk about Cycle 832. We added some new functionality there than was previously released. We took all the drilling cycles and got them to fully support four axis toolpath. So we're going to talk and show you a couple different scenarios of drilling, but um, all the drillings, the standard can drilling cycles in that post will work with any four axis toolpath. We've increased the functionality of the workpiece blank because now that you're on a four axis machine, there's um, some different features available. So we're going to look at that. Um, there's a new application guide, so we'll dig into that a little bit. That's um, published and released by Mastercam, and that'll uh, reflect a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. And then there's some higher level commands like F groups we're going to get into, and, and just some, some things we did just to simplify or streamline the editor from our perspective. So Let's go into utilizing the post. We're going to talk to you about how to get it, what you can do, how to modify it up. So first and foremost, what was the post designed to really support? Well, two core applications. So um, I can do kind of plain style milling. That would be like a three plus one scenario where maybe it's a tombstone or just a part where I need to position and do some two to three axis toolpath on. So the post is fully integrated to support that kind of functionality in different planes and orientated in Mastercam. Or we can go in and we can fully support four-axis, multi-axis toolpath. So if you're doing any kind of machining where you have to have um, si some simultaneous rotary and linear movement together, the post supports that as well. So really any kind of application you would run into from a traditional four-axis toolpath um, the system has the ability to support both vertical and horizontal machine tools. Um, so really any, any scenario that you would you come into. Now, certainly there, there could be some custom applications that might, might need some tweaking. But like I said earlier, the base post should get you 90, 95% there. Okay. So usually the first question whenever we get into these posts is, how do I get it? How do I get the post? And there's a couple different ways to get it. Certainly, if you actively are working with a Mastercam reseller, I would reach out to the Mastercam reseller, uh, let them know uh, about the post, that you've heard about it, and they can certainly provide it directly for you. But if you're a registered user with Mastercam, 
as long as you have a uh, you know a, a, a physical dongle or um, a registered licensed copy of MasterCam, you can create a, a login on mastercam.com if you don't already have one. And once you've logged in, then you gain access to what's called the Tech Exchange. So come in, log in with your credentials, mastercam.com. Under Support, you're going to find the Tech Exchange pull down. And when you go to the Tech Exchange, that's when you're going to come in and you can browse to any number of posts, our posts included. You're going to pick the version. Now, um, not all posts are going to be supported in all versions. Generally, what happens is we usually support it in the last two latest versions. So when we first did the, um, the three-axis post, we wrote it for uh, version 9 in 2017. And once the post is there, it'll be updated, so it gets updated to the newer version. But the four-axis post, that was written and designed around 2018 and 2019. So the post is available under both releases, but we wouldn't, you wouldn't find it for X9 or 2017. Um, you know, we got to keep moving forward. It's hard to try to always go backwards all the time. So it just gives you some incentive to stay up to date with the current releases of MasterCam. Now, with that being said, just because you have the post and you're working with it, it's not a bad idea to come in and, and take a look and see what the latest post release revision number is. Um, so you're not necessarily going to get any kind of notification if we added a feature or updated a bug or something in the post. Um, but what we do, and you can see that in the lower red box, is there's a version number assigned to every post. So come in, take a look at the version number. I'm going to show you in a, in a few slides where you find the version number at the post level. And it's just one of those things where, you know, maybe every now and then you want to come in and, and check just to see what the latest one is. Or, God forbid, you were having a problem. That would be probably the first thing I would do is come in and check to see if you're running the latest release of the post. Okay, so what happens there is, you know, once you log in and you pick the post, it's a simple download. You're going to unzip it, and there's some files. And one of the files you're going to find in there is a PDF, and that's what we call the application guide. So this was uh, published by MasterCam, and it steps you through kind of all of the unique functionality that's in the post. It also steps you through how do I install the post, how do I get it and get it running. So really anything you see here, pretty much paralleled in that application guide. So if you're going to grab the post, if you're going to implement it, then you certainly want to um, you certainly want to kind of follow the application guide and it'll step you through how to install and set up the post. So I'm going to show you that as well today. So we're going to look at that quickly. So you come in, you, you basically you unzip it and you're going to get a, a series of files. So you're going to have a control depth Def, uh, definition file. You're going to have a machine, just a few machine definition files. And you're going to have a file that has a PST and a PSB extension. So really from that, the first two files you want to pay attention to are the PST and the PSB. And that's what's going to get copied into your post folder. And the post folder is found in your shared MasterCam 2018 or 2019 directory. Um, under that shared shared directory, you're going to find mill, because this is a mill post, and then you'll find the folder for posts. So you copy those two files into that directory. Now the rest of the files, so the files with a MMD extension or a control extension, those are all going to go to the same directory, and that's your CNC machines directory found under the root of shared master camp. Now, where your shared master cam is, it's really up to you and your install. So I can't necessarily tell you where you installed it to. Um, you can have changed the path on it. Um, a lot of times I think it naturally wants to install to my docs, but don't quote me on that. Um, I certainly have mine set up in my docs. But just find, do a search if you don't know where it is, find the shared master cam folder, and then that's where you're going to drop the post. And you notice with the machine definition files, we are both supporting a vertical machining center or a horizontal machining center. So once you download this, you'll be able to support either kinematic type. Now, um, the vertical is going to be a standard out-of-the-box um, A-axis rotary. So if you have some kind of different combination, that's where you would have to do some tweaking. Um, and I want to say, if memory serves me, the horizontal, that's going to be a uh, C-axis style, or a not C, a, I think it's a B-axis rotary combination. But again, if, if you 
are slightly different. There would just be a little bit of modification or tweaking to the post to get it to comply with that system. So we copy in the files, we move those files in, now the post is available. So from there, let's talk a little bit about some of the key features we're going to highlight in, in today, over the course of the next hour, and some of the things that we're going to concentrate on. Now what you'll notice is, from the three-axis guide to the four-axis guide, there's a lot of similarities. So we really kind of use the three-axis content as a building block. Um, to develop the four axis post. So all the functionality that was there in the three axis post is found in the four axis, but then we expanded it. And the expansion wasn't necessarily just four axis topics. So there are some new features. Um, so one of the things we, we added were these, these groups. Uh, groups is just a simpler way to kind of um, navigate through our control. And we'll show you that. Um, we certainly added some new functionality like Cycle 32 So there could be features that you're going to see here that would easily apply to the three axis post. Um, and what we're going to do, uh, we're going to take some of these features and we're going to kind of go back and we will be planning to update the three axis post the, so it'll, it'll gain all of the functionality that you're now seeing in this four axis post. So those, these are the topics that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about groups, the work piece blank, we'll get into cycle 32. We're going to show you a little bit about the drilling. And then we're going to talk about feed groups, some little more advanced topics, and then talk about home position, rotary access, a couple other things. So one of the things when you look at the new post, you're going to see that the format looks a little different. So Mastercam implemented a new format from their side. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I really like it. It makes navigating the post a little bit easier. So the post you see on the left, that's the original three axis post. And here it was just line by line from start to end. You just kind of had to you know, work your way down through the post. Now they've added these things where you basically have like blocks or groups that can be expanded or contracted. So if you notice in that little blow up to the right, there's regional revision log or uh, region features and notes or common user switches. So each of those plus keys can be expanded or contracted. So now, if I know that, hey, I'm usually making most of my modification in the switches section, which is where we do a lot of the modification, I can quickly come down, get to 284 while I'm looking at that first screen, open that up, and I'm just concentrating in that area. So it's just really a navigation thing, um, but certainly it, is, it has made it um, a little bit simpler to navigate through the post. So if you, if you have the 3-axis post, you've watched this, the previous webinar, you're going to see that it's just going to look just a little bit different. Now, either of the posts where they've always kept the support or the revision control numbers, the version revision, is going to be right at the top of the post. So you see it right on line two. You're going to see a number. Now, the first two digits of the number, so the 20 in this case, that always reflects the master cam version. So that's never going to change. So 20 is actually signifying 2018. If there was a value of 21 there, that would be 2019, and so on and so forth. So any post that get released for 2018 will always start with a 20, but the after the decimal point, those last two digits, those are going to reflect the version number of the post. So in this case, the latest revision release of the Forex's post is .83. So you do want to make sure that that's the one you're running. And like I said, from time to time, go to the Tech Exchange, take a look. It's quick, easy. You see it right there in the notes, um, and make sure that you're you're running the latest post. Maybe maybe worth downloading and taking a look at the latest one. Now, just be careful if you've done a lot of modifications to the post you're running. The new post isn't going to know that, so you would have to make those updates if you download the new post. Okay, so there's functionality that we incorporate in the post we call switches. And switches really just allow me to turn on and off features in a post processor. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, back in the three axis post, which we reflected again here, we allow tool naming. So in the Siemens control, you can give the tool a number, T1, T2, T3, or you can call it a name. It's uh, half inch handle, it's a three, it's a three quarter inch end mill. Um, I got a, strange uh, sound that I'd heard. I just want to make sure everybody still got my audio. I want to make sure we didn't drop out. No, it doesn't seem like we dropped out. Everybody's still good. If somebody could just type into the chat window real quick, I would appreciate it. 
Okay, good. Well, don't know what that was, but we're going to keep moving on. That was a little strange. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Okay, so so the post switches, that just allows me to turn on and off functions. So like the tool naming. If I don't want tool naming, I don't have to use tool naming. I can just always use tool numbers. I'm just going to change the yes to a no. Now, if there's multiple options you're going to see in some of the later ones, then we may give you a number value and then just pick the number. And the post writer did a really great job of putting a lot of notes and detail inside this post. So if there's any question, read through it. You're probably going to have a, a pretty good shot of understanding exactly what, what he's asking you for, what the functionality is. And certainly by the end of this webinar, I think you're all going to have a, a real clear version, you know, view of it. But if you don't remember, again, it's the notes are there to kind of steer you to be able to adapt to the post. Okay. So let's start with our first function. And our first function that we added is the group function. So inside the post switch on line 305, like I see on the top, there is a output underscore group. And right now I have it set to yes. Now, if I look at the output toolpath, if I you know, post out three or four operations, like you're seeing on my operation toolpath window on the left, the only thing I'm going to see in the G code initially, at least in the master cam editor, is I'll see this little label that says group begin, and then inside a syntax string, It'll tell you what operation number you're looking at. And then further down in the toolpath, you're eventually going to see group end. And that's, that's all. I just get a couple extra lines. But what it does in the Siemens control is it now allows you to have, just like you kind of saw in the Mastercam post, these blocks that can be expanded and contracted. So I'm on the right looking at three different operations of toolpath. If you look all the way down after op three, I can see on one page up to sequence line 18,814. So what we did was we basically took the core toolpath, right, the, the operation, which is usually just a lot of G1s and G0s, you know, moving around in space, and we basically condensed them inside these groups. And now in the editor, I can open and close the groups. So like if I bring up Sinu Train and I go into a, a master cam file. So you're going to see in the editor, you're going to see this line that says groups. And really, if you're just on the line and you hit your blue arrow to the right, it's going to now expand. And now you're going to get all the toolpath for that given group. Or if I was to have con contracted it by using the blue arrow to the right, it'll compress them. So I can quickly expand and contract. So what we did was we took out really the stuff that you need to know right off the bat. You know, if I'm going to quickly look at a toolpath, what's one of the first things I want to know? Well, I probably want to know what operation I'm in. It's a valid thing. I'm going to want to know what tool, um, most likely speeds and feeds, right? So we kept that simple, more common stuff that you would always want to look at just above where we put the operation tab in. And then, really, we left the, the core code, right, the base toolpath, down here, down inside the meat of, meat of this. So if you think you need to get to a given line, take a look at some other things, you can quickly expand it. But if I'm looking at four or five different operations, I can quickly get down through the operations real fast, right? So had I had a couple different operations, uh, let me see if I have one that has multiples. Um, if not, we'll, we'll be posting something a little later anyway. Uh, no, it doesn't look like I have something with multiples at this point. But had I had a multiples, I would just see op one, then op two, just like you saw on that previous slide, and I can kind of zip down through it. So that's your groups. Now, if it's something that, um, from a software version, we've had them for a long time, but if it's something that you don't want to see, just set that switch to a no, and then you, it, won't, it won't actually show it. So the simplest way to get into the post to start to uh, modify different things in the physical post is you want to post something out in Mastercam. So just be in some toolpath, really doesn't matter what I'm going to post, and you want to tell it I'm going to post out the toolpath. You're going to get your little pop-up window here. Um, I'm just going to let it overwrite whatever files there, but I want to let it edit it. And this is the trick. I want the Mastercam editor to pop up. I'm not worried about posting. Oh, hold on. I probably have. Yep. B 
be careful if you have Sinutrain running at the same time. Mastercam doesn't like it if I try to post into a file that's being edited. I can't say I blame it. All right, let's go back to it. Okay, let's post it again. All right, so like I said, post the operation. It's going to bring up our editor here. So here's your editor. This is the toolpath. Here's our group statement, like I mentioned, that's from that switch. And what you want to do to get to the post is simply use the open command. They have it automatically point, point to the folder for posts. So you see it right here. So wherever that post folder is, it automatically points there. You just have to change your file type to post file. And now you're going to see all files with the PST extension. Now, remember where there were two files, PST and PSB? You're only ever concerned with the PST file. PSB is an encrypted file. It's nothing that you can edit. But all the stuff that you need to worry about is found right inside this PST file. So highlight it, click open. It's going to bring it up as a separate tab. And I uh, like you can kind of zoom in, right? And this is the post, what we're running. So remember I said all your stuff's down here in the switches section? This is pretty much where you're going to do almost all of your edits. So come down to switches. You can hit the little plus key. We can expand up. And now we're in the post switch section. So how do I want it to change my groups? I just come down to where it says yes. I literally change that to a no, just like you would see here. Save it. I don't have to even close the post. I can leave this up in this little editor. Repost, and then you'll see that it's not outputting groups. Or any of the functions we're about to kind of go through right now. That's, that's really, I mean, it's not very complex to get in and start to modify that, that basic stuff. Now, you do want to be careful where you go inside the post. There's a lot going on there. So I would say, you know, be, be careful when you start to change stuff. Um, might not hurt to, you know, save a backup file of the post to a different name. Just, God forbid, you, you stepped on something. Okay. So this is the groups. Now, from there, the next thing we added, which, um, which is found in newer versions of our software. Um, we brought this clamping functionality in in version 4.5. So if you have older software on your machine, 4.4 or earlier, uh, you won't be able to take advantage of this um, clamping function. Um, or it really depends on how the, the, the builder commissions it. Generally, you don't see the clamping option if you don't have a four axis machine. But once you get a four or five axis machine, so a machine with rotaries, then you get this clamping field. So if you have the clamping option, what that does is it allows us to orient cylinders now oriented in, in the direction of the rotary axes, where before, without clamping, all of our cylinders were always pointing in Z. And on a four-axis machine, that's not really where I would want them, right? I want them rotating about my X-axis on an A-axis rotary or my Y on a B-axis. So here's a perfect example where you want to read the notes. So this is saying machine supports clamping and workpiece blank with a question mark. So that's the question to you. Hey, does your machine have the clamping option? So go into the machine, create a blank. If you see clamping, you got it. So then change, set this to a yes. And I want to say, I think the default is yes. If you don't have clamping, don't output it because it won't be able to use it. Now, when you look at the output code in the cycle string, you'll see there'll be the axis that, we're, that our clamping is oriented in or or what I'm clamped on, it'll come in as the, you know, it'll, it'll match the rotary axis that the, the post was commissioned for. Um, you set it to a no, it's going to go back to its normal orientation. Now, once you've turned clamping on, your cylinder has to be oriented in master cam with, in the direction of that rotary axis. So had I set up the cylinder and I wanted it to be pointed in Z, Maybe I have the four axis post, but I'm, I'm working off of a, a vice or something, and I'm not really using it. Well, if you have clamping on, it's going to tell you that you, you can't do that because we're expecting it to be oriented in the fourth axis. So you've got, you got a couple options there. Um, you, can, you can turn the clamping to a no if you, if you want to do that. Um, you can not worry about the blank here at this point, maybe even turn the blank off, and then just set it up out the machine tool. Um, remember, with the when it comes to the the workpiece blank, you don't have to output it. That was a post switch. So you know, if we looked back at our post switches, we come down here. Where are we? 
I think it's a little further down. Yep. So here is where we can work on the clamping or the blank, and we can also suppress the workpiece blank. So you know you're gonna you're gonna kind of kind of tweak that um, in in either scenario depending on how you want it how you want it to function. And again, if if you're not sure if your machine supports it, just go over to your machine, open up a program, G code or conversational shouldn't matter. Now G code, you're going to go to the various screen, you're going to go to your blank option, and now if you have clamping, you're going to get a clamping field here, and now you can toggle it back and forth. Now if you're on a five axis, you'll see there'll be two rotaries here usually in a lot of times. Um, so if the clamping field's not there, you don't support it, you want to leave that at a no. When it comes to um, shop mill, pro, um, our conversational program, and I'll just do uh, I'll just do something just to just to get it open. You'll see that in the header page, right? So if I have it here in shop mill, I would see it here in the header page. Of course, you know everything we're posting is going to be G code, so that's really I'm more concerned there. But if you have it, it's going to be in both places. Okay, so that's the the new clamping feature. Um, certainly, if I'm working off a of bar stock, it does it does make it nice to be able to drive the orientation right from Mastercam. Now, advanced surface. Um, so, prior to this, we didn't really refer to our high-speed routine as advanced surface. It was just cycle A32. The advanced surface is actually the back-end function that was automatically being called by cycle A32. Well, since the creation of the 3 axis post, we here at Siemens have re released a new algorithm um, for our high-speed machining. So it's, um, it's basically got some new toolpath strategies. It is an option in our control. So even if you're running the newer software, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have it. But that option is called top surface. So this is going to be one of those things, again, you're going to want to check out at your machine. Um, and I'm going to show you how to check it in a couple different spots because it won't always necessarily even be a selection in cycle A32. This is where it kind of depends on how the builder set up your machine tool. He may be forcing you to always run in top surface. Um, if, that's, if that's the case, then you're not going to get this selection. It's just going to look like as if it was advanced surface. So I was going to show you two different ways when we get to the control of how to validate it. But what we did in Mastercam is we now give you the ability of telling us, instead of automatically getting, which was the original option one, now you got five different options, really, of how you want to set up and handle high-speed toolpath. So option one, or format one, is the way the three-axis post was set up. So what that does is that is a standard numerical string. The second digit always reflected the machining tape. So is it roughing, semi-finishing, or finishing? Three is roughing, two is semi-finishing, so on and so forth. Now, originally we supported this format because this was the um, this went back to the furthest versions within the Siemens control. So, if I was running a system starting with 2.6 software right up through, they all support this decimal formatting, and that's still true today. So, if I have a brand new machine running the latest greatest software, and I just have advanced surface on the machine tool, I can still run this decimal formatting. But what we did from the Siemens side is we changed the format to also support a, a verbal or a string variable inside the cycle call. So underscore rough was in place of three. The functionality from the control side was exactly the same. So originally we said, well, do we really need to have two options? Well, when we were just in the exam surface, we didn't, they didn't really need it. But with a new feature, we figured, you know what, we'll support all of them. So if I use a selection of two, I'm only going to get advanced surface, but I'm going to see this, this uh, rough, semi-fin, or fin uh, variable get output in the cycle call. But we also now have format three or four, and those now use the top surface function. Okay. Now format three is going to always output a numerical value. And again, this will work right in the latest, greatest code. And then format four, which we get to in a sec, you'll see a verbal statement. Now, when you get to top surface, there's a new trigger, there's a new option here. So even if I have a machine running top surface, I may want to toggle between advanced surface 
or top surface, and I may want to turn on or off a function we call smoothing. So this, this new option under your miscellaneous values allows you to kind of control what the cycle A32 output's going to look like. Um, so this would be in the actual operation of your toolpath. You know, I pick a pocketing cycle and I want high speeds to be on. So option one has smoothing off. So if I looked at the control, once I push this in, you're going to see the smoothing option would be off. And then a value of two would be smoothing on. And if I chose a value of zero, then I would get advanced surface, not top surface. And you'd see this would say advanced surface. And then format four, which is probably the most preferred if you're going to run top surface, it's going to output the string variable or just a named variable inside, and you can still toggle. So from an operation standpoint, no matter what we have, the post switch three or four, it's going to work the same way. So uh, zero is just advanced surface, one smoothing off, two smoothing on, but running top surface. So when I'm using it and I want to trigger it, Again, I would be in some toolpath in Mastercam. And in any of the toolpath, you're always going to see a miss values section. And this is where you turn it on. So you want to unselect the checkbox if you can't edit it initially. And then you're going to see a few options. So there's really four options within this. And this, this really kind of stayed the same as it was in the three axes, except for this new top, top surface function. So the first question is, do you want Mastercam to kind of figure out if you should be using advanced surface or top surface if you should be using the high-speed routine or do you want to manually override that I would say probably more times than not you're probably going to pick a manual override because you generally are going to know a little better than Mastercam whether you should use it um, there are certain toolpaths that Mastercam it was pretty obvious to Mastercam that this is a high-speed roughing or finishing style toolpath and specifically it's all on the 3d surfacing toolpaths um, so that's really all that is if you have it set to auto at zero, it may or may not output cycle A32, but your lady master can make the decision. If you set it to a one, it's now gonna do whatever the next line says. And the next line it says, a zero value would say off. So no, there's no cycle A32 running at all. Or I can pick the operation type. Now, why would I wanna force it to be off? Well, one of the things we do um, automatically, if you use um, top surface or advanced surface, is we linearize all our toolpath. So that means all output toolpath is just going to be line moves. Um, and that's because of our spline compressor. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons behind it. We could probably talk for another half an hour just on this topic alone. But at the end of the day, if I look at my toolpath, I'm always going to just see G1s with advanced surface or top surface on, with cycle 832 on. Well, maybe I want to have arc moves. Maybe it's, it's not really a high-speed toolpath, and I want to have a much smaller program, so I want to see G2s and G3s. Well, if I force that to be off, then it's going to output arcs, depending on how I have the, um, this, the machine, um, the configuration file set up. But generally, that's the, by default, that's what it would automatically do. But if I know that I want to use Segway 32, then I just pick the the physical strategy, right? Roughing or semi-finishing. Then you have the smoothing function if I want to use top surface or not. We just talked about that. And then the final thing is the chordal tolerance. So a lot of times you may not necessarily know what chordal tolerance you want. So if you leave this to a zero, then the system's going to automatically output the default values for either roughing, semi-finishing, or finishing. If you know what your chordal tolerance you want, or you're playing around with different tolerance types for different toolpaths, then you can force that. Just type in the number. Um, and then, you know, an inch, you're going to be, I would say, anywhere from 5 to 10 thou max in a roughing scenario. Usually 4 to 5 thou is pretty, pretty uh, standard. Finishing, you might find yourself going all the way down to, you know, a couple tenths of an inch. Okay. So from there, we now added the features and functions for our drilling cycles and drilling cycles in two different formats. So first we have kind of a plane by plane scenario. So in the plane by plane, here I would have created some form of a plane within Mastercam, and then I'm gonna do some features to it. So whether I have one hole or 10 holes or whatever I have on this plane, I would be working off that plane. So 
I would use a standard drilling style routine like you see here. And then I would be driving based on a plane I've created. And my tool plane and my construction plane would be based on that. So I would leave the work coordinate system always at top. And I would just drive the tool geometry based on the active plane or the plane I chose, right? So in this case, maybe plane three was one of them I chose. And from there, the system will then automatically output a rotary move to present that plane and then set up my modal call. Now, in this scenario, I only had one hole, so it only put out one. But if I had a couple holes on this surface plane, then I would see you know, my two or three or four holes between my two modal statements, my M calls. And then she'll swing to the next plane if I was going to jump to a couple planes like you see on this image. And I kind of move back and forth you know, down and around. So that's a very typical method for me to be outputting toolpath. I would, you know, kind of do this plane by plane scenario. Now with that, we're also supporting kind of full simultaneous four axis, not necessarily simultaneous, but the ability of doing multi-axis drilling scenarios. So in this case, I'm going to choose a multi-axis drilling path. And now I can pick a few different holes and the system, I just want to make sure I'm setting it up as a four axis output, because I certainly don't have five axis on this machine, um, and tell it the, the way my rotary is oriented. So I have a A axis rotary, so it's about X. And now I'll get a bunch of the positions, including the rotary move in that position. So in that earlier example, I could have done that one of two ways. Now I did that little routine plane by plane. But I could have picked all the holes and let it output in one shot. So let's say we were going to do that real quick just to kind of give you a simple example of it. So here is my, my tool path, right? Here we got some, some operations and I had some holes on some different planes. So I can do one hole at a time or one plane at a time. There could be a few different holes here. But if I wanted to kind of run around all these holes in one shot, you can go to multi-axis, pick drill, and now the system's going to allow me to come in and drill those holes. So I want to come, I want to pick my pattern. Right? So I'm going to just choose a few holes. And you'll notice as I click on them, it's going to give me an arrow that's pointing in the direction of the tool. So it should be pointing up to the tool. And now you just kind of, kind of walk around and get however many holes you want. So let's say there we go. We got the four holes. Once we've picked the holes, now we would define a strategy for drilling the holes. I can leave it as default as a pretty simple one. We can make sure that our tool axis control is set to our four axis and our rotary is working around our axis. You could give it some collision control if you wanted to. There's a bunch of stuff in here. Um, I can define, now normally I would set these values to zero because this would add or subtract from the surface that I chose. All right, but you fill out the routine, and now I'm going to get toolpath for these four holes. If I was to look at the toolpath here, and I simulate it, you'll see we're going to now handle all four holes, one routine. Now the retract, that was just my default retract value. Certainly I could bring that a lot closer. That's just tweaking the, uh, the numbers within the cycle. But the big thing, once we go and post it, you'll see it'll automatically handle that, and that's, and but but still using our CAM cycles, not having it output you know just standard uh, G1 and G0 routines. So if I were to take that new operation that we created, we're going to post that out. I don't need to worry about editing it. And we'll just post it out, ba boom. And if we jump over into the new train. Now we have op 17 is now here. And if I expand op 17, I will see that I got a nice, clean, concise drilling routine. So, so the way I did the, the part earlier with different planes, if I had a lot of holes on the given plane, that would be my, my method of choice, certainly. Uh, but if I have a lot of holes, you know, wrapped around a rotary, I probably would choose to use the 5X toolpath. But either way, you're still building our standard cycles. You're still going in and defining your start and your end, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. So just to give you 
a little kind of feel of what's going on here. All right. So that's the, the multi-axis uh, or the four-axis drilling support, like we mentioned. OK, so now we're moving along. And I want to present a topic. And this is a little bit of a detailed topic. It has a tendency to kind of throw guys for, for a loop a bit. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it. And that's a function called feed groups. And then the additional supporting command of our feed group reference. OK. so. This function will depend on certainly how your machine has been set up or commissioned. But, but one of the behaviors in our control, depending on whether or not the rotary is part of this feed group command, is really handling how my feed rate is being calculated by the control. So generally, the standard rule or default, or if you're guessing and you have to assume the machine was set up some certain way, the standard way most most OEMs or builders commission these machines is that no rotaries are part of the feed group calculation, just the linear axis. So that means when I go to calculate and I do a move that's including a rotary, the system will always end up at the same point in space at the same time, right? If I tell it to do a X and an A move, she's never gonna gonna end up getting there in the A first. But what happens is my feed rate is generally a, a, a behavior of the axis that's going to move the furthest distance, right? So if you thought about a simple three-axis mill, and I'm moving x, y, and z at 100 inches per minute, and x has to physically move 30 inches, and y and z are only moving two or three inches, right, from wherever I was at to wherever I'm going. Well, there's only one axis that's moving at 100 inches per minute. And that's the longest one, so it's in this case x. Well, once the rotary isn't part of the feed group, it's basically telling us that, hey, you can let this rotary move faster than, than, the, than, than normally we would expect it to, because we're not concerned about the rotary. We are only concerned about the next longest move, which is the linear axis. So the scenario we're about to show you only really occurs when the rotary motion is the longest move of the of the axis pair, right? If the rotary is these tiny little small segments and the linear is always moving further, this, this scenario doesn't really come into play. So I built a little program example like you're seeing there to try to demonstrate this concept a little bit. So I have this feed group program and all it is is I'm telling the machine I want to do an X and an A move, but I'm moving the A 1,080 degrees. So that's obviously a lot longer than a 10-inch move. Um, I'm going to comment out my feed groups right off the bat, and we're going to run this. We're going to take a look at the resulting cycle time, because that's all this really is. It's a behavior of cycle time, of how long a toolpath is going to take to run. So I run this part. I'm running at a 10 inches per minute. I'm not taking any rotaries into account. So if I look at my cycle time, it took a minute to run. Well, that would make sense. If I'm moving my X 10 inches at a feed rate of 10 inches a minute, I should take a minute. And the little bit of time was the preposition, those couple of seconds here. But if I think about how far the rotary traversed, right? If I was to take this little spiral and pull it out and make it straight, the actual green toolpath that the cutter went, right? Let's zoom in a little bit. All right, if I think about this green line, well, that's a lot longer than 10 inches. But if the feed group's not enabled, it's saying, you know, I, I don't really care what the rotary does. I can go a little faster because I really want to just calculate feed based off the linear. Well, in a part geometry like this, I now had a much higher chip load or different chip load, uh, higher in this case, than I'm expecting. So I could get tool degradation, surface finish qualities, all kinds of problems can start to arise. So we have a function we call feed groups. So now, if I go into the part program, I can enable the feed group command. And what the feed group command is going to allow me to do is that's going to allow me to now tell the system, hey, I want the A 
to be included in the feed rate calculation. So if we go and run, and I'm just going to run it here with our cycle time. Well, all I did was uncomment one line. I run it now. Look at the cycle time. So the system is now calculating that my rotary is part of this calculation. So now it's going four minutes and 24 seconds, so four and a half minutes basically, to do the exact same move. Once we go down the road of feed groups, what we now need to know is where am I in relation to the center of the rotary, right? Because if I think of that spiral, if I'm 10 inches out on a rotary radially, that length of spiral is going to be much bigger than if I was one inch out. So that's where the F gref comes into play. This is your reference. So by default, if you don't tell it anything and you just boot up the system, there's a machine data that sets it, but generally it's set to four inch or 100 millimeters by default. So if I'm way outside of that range, I'm still getting a missed calculation. So I can come in and I can now tell it, okay, maybe I'm at a one inch radius. And it's going to use this reference to know how far away from the center of the rotary the tool physically is. So I set it to one inch, we run it. Remember, we were just at four, four minutes 30. I just cut my cycle time in half. If I put myself back out to a larger radius, so in our case, this part, um, I think it probably was a four inch diameter part, two inch radius. Actually, yeah, I was cutting at 1.9. So um, right, right here, I'm at 1.9. Um, I set the zero in this scenario, just to be simple, as the center of my part. So if I put this to 1.9, and this is always a radial value, now I execute, and I should get as close to the optimal chip load as I'm expecting to. So this is what's called feed groups. And the reason why this scenario even exists is it keeps you from having to jump into inverse time um, or all sorts of different other feed strategies. Um, but the reason why we don't always include the rotors in the feed groups is when I get to a five axis machine and I'm using functionality, what we call rotary tool point compensation, Traori, well, the rotary in that scenario never actually moves the tool along. The tool is only moving by the linear moves. So the rotary only changes orientation. So in that case, on a five axis tool path, if I have a feed group on, I'm actually giving up cycle time and it has no bearing. If anything, it's slowing down my tool. So I'm reducing my proficiency. I'm reducing my chip load, but I'm also losing cycle time. So standard rule of thumb, if you are running Traori, then you do not want your rotaries to be part of your feed group command and you don't have to give this stuff. But if you are not using Traori, and your rotary axis has a direct result of the motion the tool, path, the tool is going along the part, like you saw in our nice little spiral here, then you want to start to implement feed groups. So in the post, and hopefully that's, that's a little clearer, it's, it's one of those concepts that it's easier to show once we get to a real machine, um, but hopefully you guys kind of got that. Um, so from the post side, we added the feed group function inside the post. It can be turned on or off. So if you're just doing that, you know, plane by plane kind of tool path, you're not doing any simultaneous and you don't want to worry about seeing feed groups, you can just set the post switch to a no, and then you're not going to get any feed groups. If you have it to a yes, then you're going to set up what we allow to be the, um, the maximum amount of deviation you can be before it outputs another uh, feed group reference or F graph. Right, so if I'm at a value of 1.6 and I'm getting, you know, uh, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm moving down a 50 thou or 100 thou and up 50 thou as far as that that reference radius, we didn't want Mastercam to be outputting a bunch of f-graphs. It's not going to hurt it, but it's not really necessary. You know, you move up and down within a half inch distance, you're not going to see a huge difference in feed rate. So that's what this value is, and then the metric metric equivalent. So the smaller I make that number potentially the more F reference references I'll see. I find on a lot of tool paths, um, unless you're, you don't have, you know, unless you have huge deviations or differences in where you are in relation to the radius of that rotary, you may only get one, one or two F graph references. But setting the right reference, that's critical. Now, from there, you're gonna have these, 
these um, names, right? And the name is spelled out in the feed group string, right? So it's important that you get these names right. And we talk about it again, the label's right in the post, but this is the machine data it reflects. It's not always necessarily XYZ. Even though your machine always reads XYZ, the builder could have labeled the, or named the channel label X1, XX, some other crazy terminology. You don't necessarily see that from an end user until you get to some of these higher level commands. So if you're pushing in what you would logically think to be as you know, XYZA, and the system's giving you a syntax alarm, go to this machine data and see what values are entered here. These values there need to be reflected inside of the post switch. And if I go back, need to be the exact values that are pushed into the cycle string. So that's where that comes into play. So make sure you get those right or you will get an alarm. Here, I wanted to give you an example of how to put a pretty small tolerance in that uh, deviation value how it would start to output multiple feed growth references. This is, again, this is okay, but not, it's not really doing a whole lot for me. So like I said, I would leave it at the default, which uh, I believe we set to a half an inch, um, should be more than close enough. But if you run into some surface quality, if you're really trying to get that perfect finish and you think that this is uh, hurting you, you tighten up the tolerance a little bit. You'll just get more references out of the system. Now, what would happen if we didn't have the feed group command? So what ends up happening is the system, by default, is going to look at this group of parameters, this feed group default axes. And if you look in the help or you read a little bit about it, what it says is if these values are all at zero, I'm only going to use the geometry axis as part of my feed group reference. So is it possible that an OEM set up a machine that will default to using the rotaries as part of the feed group? Yes. Um, in that case, is me putting the feed group again going to help me? Nope, but it's not going to hurt you either. It's just a duplicate man to what they set up. So you can always check your machine if you want to be 100% sure of how it was commissioned by looking at these uh, MDs or just push the feed group. I would say a standard kind of gut reaction if you know you're doing simultaneous 4-axis toolpath on a 4-axis machine and you don't have Traori, which you generally would not, output feed groups. It's not going to hurt you. It's going to help you, trust me. Okay. So next thing that you will have to make sure that you modify or support within the post is your 4th-axis brake if you're using a brake. So if you are using a brake and you need to trigger the brake, uh, one, if you want to output the brake command, uh, yes or no scenario right here in the post switch access locking use rotary access locker codes and if this is a yes then it's going to use by default m10 and m11 but this is an area where you may need to go down into the post and modify this in a different section so if you look under the region string select lookup table and c section down at block 945, this is where you'll find the M codes we're pushing out. So every builder, <laughs> trust me, every builder assigns different M codes when it comes to your fourth axis break. Um, so you're going to want to check your M code list and you're going to want to update the post. So just to show you, if I start to scroll down a little bit, I need to get into, I was think it was 945 or something or thereabouts. Uh, duh, duh, or not 945, what was I just looking at, hold on, uh, oh yeah, 945, okay, good. So you go into your post, get down to line 945, there it is, boom, there we go, 945, 46, there is your M codes, um, certainly you could also just do a quick search for M11 and it'll, it'll find it here. So if your machine was an M14, M15, or 13 or whatever, just change the M. Leave the quotes, because that's what's pushing it out. So just change the M11 or the M10 to match unlock and lock. And that's important, obviously. You don't want to get those backwards, or the timing's going to be all wrong. But that's a, a very, very common one you're going to have to tweak 
because trust me, every OEM does it differently. Now, usually you'll find consistencies in the OEM. So if uh, you have a lot of fryer machines, for argument's sake, they'll use one set of M codes. Uh, DMG is somebody different, or Hyundai, or whoever, MCO, let's say. Um, so you always want to check from the manufacturer what M codes he used. Okay. With that being said, there's a couple other options, and then we'll open up some questions here. So um, we had the home position before. That's our SUPA, you know, machine retract to some safety position. But in just kind of streamlining and simplifying some things, we are now adding a variable at the top of the program so you could quickly change this value. So before, if I wanted to change my SUPA line, I had to go into the post and I had to edit these numbers. So if I wanted to kind of drive it to some different locations or if I'm moving this program from a couple different machines, now I would have to find where the super line was, make a manual edit there, or try to update the post and repost it. So now what's going to happen is right at the top of your program, you're going to see the variables automatically. So I don't have to go searching through the program to find the 50 different super lines I have. I can make a quick update right at the top, and that's going to be the number it uses for every time it does a super command. So it's by default going to use the default home position. So you can type in whatever number you want if you know you're going to say that same value on your machine. But once I get to the machine, if I need to edit it for any reason, get a fixture in the way, whatever I'm doing, if you look now, as long as we have that turned on, which we do on mine, you're going to get these two lines. Now the def line, you're never going to edit that. That you need to leave alone. But what you're going to edit is you're going to edit these values. So if I wanted my machine to go to a machine position of positive 10 inches, I could type that right here. And then down at the bottom of the program, it would, use, it would substitute this value for that variable. So if you think about it, if I have super commands before every operation or sprinkled through the toolpath, this just saves me from having to find a bunch of different places to edit it. So that's just one of those kind of niceties that, that kind of simplifies supporting the toolpath once you get out at the at the machine tool. Now, when it comes to the rotary axis output, there's a couple different ways you can set it up. And you know, this was this was a point of a lot of discussion between myself and Mastercam when we were building this post. Is how do we make this post be as universal as possible? When you get to different builders, it's, oh, boy, there's a ton of different ways to set up just something as simple as a rotary axis. Does it go shortest path? Does it go longest path? Is it, is it driven um, as a, what we call a medullo axis? So every time it goes 360 degrees, does it return to zero? Or does it continue to accrue so I can tell it to go to 10,000 degrees, but then I have to unwind the axes, right? Bunch of different ways. So by default, what we did was we set up the system to use the DC command. And the DC command basically says, I'm going to, no matter how the machine was commissioned, I'm going to move shortest path. And I found in all sorts of different strategies, I found that um, that worked certainly the best, the most consistent. Now, there are going to be certain scenarios, depending on how your OEM set up your table, where it may not work the way you, you, you need it to or you want it to. So there are, there's another way to set it up, which I'm going to show you here in a sec. But by default, you're going to see all these A equals DC command. And all that says is, hey, I'm going to move 66 degrees, but I'm going to get there in the shortest path. That's, that's all that's telling you. So if I have this to a yes, that's what I'm going to see in my output. But if I have it to a no, now it's going to be dependent on the machine definition file. And remember, we had copied all those files in before, and a bunch of those were machine defs. So you would have to go into the appropriate machine def file, and inside the machine def, right in here, this is how I would drive. Is it signed continuous, signed direction, shortest direction? Um, all that is being now looked at. So if a value of yes is here, no matter what you set the machine definition to, it's going to always do the shortest path. But if there's a value of no, then it's dependent on this page. So if you have to tweak your machine because it's commissioned a little differently, 
you would have to go into the machine control definition manager, find the rotary axis, and then you could tweak it as needed. Um, and then in that scenario, you're going to just see the rotary axis output um, without the DC equals command. So a lot of times guys at first don't understand the syntax and they think it seems a little foreign. Um, but trust me, I would leave it at yes. Try running the toolpath first. If it's not working the way we expect it, then I would say, you know, go in, set it to a no, and you can try to tweak it a little bit and see if we can we can get there. Um, but, but like I said, the, the most common scenarios I threw out at the DC um, seem to work on all of them. So that certainly uh, generally makes the post the most universal we can get it. Okay, so there's only one last topic that I wanted to talk about here, and then we're going to open up to some questions. So as I'm talking about this last topic, you're all, you're all welcome to start typing in some questions too into either the Q&A or the chat window. Um, Q&A would probably be a little easier for me because we do have a bunch of chat stuff already in there. And this is really just more of, I wanted to make you aware of a scenario that occurs with the Siemens control that can throw guys off a little bit um, and show you how we combated it inside the post. Okay. So generally when you're programming in a Siemens control, you're programming anything, everything in uh, feed per minute, right? So, so standard linear type of, type of feed rate. And if I add any rotaries to it, it doesn't matter, it's still always programming in feed per minute, right? So 100 inches per minute, I'm, I'm moving on my way. Well, that's all well and good until I get to a scenario where I do not have any linear axes moving at the time of the rotary axes. So when that occurs, the system says, well, I can't calculate a linear feed because I'm not doing a linear move, I'm doing a, a, a degreed move, right? A rotary move. So the system will automatically switch its time base to degrees per minute. Well, if I can think, if I think about the rate of speed of 100 inches per minute, that's pretty quick, right? That's moving right along. The equivalent of 100 inches per minute switched to 100 degrees per minute is super slow. So the scenario that you would see is I'd be moving, I'd be doing a bunch of, you know, linear and rotary cuts at the same time, and then I would get to a position where just the rotary had to move and the system would automatically change its time base. So you see right in my TFS window, I'm now reading degrees per minute. I didn't program degrees per minute, but again, since we're only running a rotary, I have to be in degrees per minute. And now all of a sudden the machine's going super slow. So to combat this behavior, because this is always gonna occur, there's nothing you can change in the system to prevent this. It's just the nature of how the Siemens control works. We do what's called a non-modal feed change. Well, that's your FB equals command. So what Mastercam is doing is it's saying, hey, if I detect any rotary only moves, I'm then going to calculate where I am uh, in my distance from my radius, and I'm going to calculate the equivalent of the linear feed I was running at. So in this example, oops, sorry guys, in this example, I was um, running at 50 inches per minute. So the mathematical equivalent of that, based on where I am in the radius, would be 1,469 degrees per minute. So we're going to output an FB equals. Now, you're going to see this on every line because this is a non-modal move. We did non-modal because it would keep us from having to necessarily reinstate the feed. And this one, it happened to push it back in, but it's not required. It would automatically reinstate the feed rate. Um, if I were to, you know, just you know, on the next line, next actual line. So you'll only see the FB equals on the axis lines that's just a rotary moving by itself. And then the system's going to return back to its original linear feed rate, and I'll only see it switch back again when this condition occurs. So I have a little program example here. So in this toolpath, you start to see the switches between the two. So I just wanted to run this real quick and show you kind of the behavior as to what happens. So I'm gonna crank down my speed so it's going a lot slower. And if you look at the program toolpath, you're gonna to see, uh, excuse me, all right, she's um, gonna to default to G94, right? Because I'm not telling it anything else. And that's why I'm in a feed per minute, in this case, inch per minute mode. So I start cycle start and she's running, doing a thing. Now watch what happens when I get to just the rotary command. 
the system's automatically switching you in degrees per minute. And that's why we need to increase the feed rate so I'm maintaining the same tool speed, right? Same speed at my cutter, because that's my critical portion. And the further away I was on the radius, the uh, faster I would have to move because the further distance. So it's kind of a little bit like the feed groups I were talking about earlier. Um, but in this case, it's just a matter of feed rate, of speed. Now, if you have um, a lot more decimal places outputting, you're probably going to see this condition a lot less because you're more likely to have a linear move with it. Um, I kind of try to make a pretty severe case so you can kind of see the, the behavior. But I'm not doing anything to switch this. The program's not doing anything to switch it. The control's doing it on its own because it sees a move of just a rotary that does not include a linear. Okay. So with that being said, I think we're at a pretty good point. We are going to open up to some questions. Certainly my contact information is here too for those of you that would like to reach out to me. But it looks like we got some questions here. So let's start to go through them. Uh, is the rotary lock controlled by a miscellaneous integer, or must you edit the post to turn it on and off? Um, I believe you have to modify the post to turn it on or off. I do not think that we um, anticipated a miss value here. This is like a this is a four-axis pocket, right? So this is our top pocket, and if I go into my geometry, let me bring that over. And miss value, we do not have a miss value for allowing you to force it. So if you have the clamp on, then the system's automatically going to handle it for you. Um, so it'll turn it off. Um, but you would not have the w a way of overriding that without turning on or off in the post. Okay, good question. Um, do. How do we get the post and the related docs? So um, back to what I mentioned earlier, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to mastercam.com. You're going to want to log in. So you see I'm logged in right now as a user, but you log in to whatever your user login is. If you haven't created a login yet, just come in here, create the login. It's going to ask for your SIM numbers. It's pretty minor. I didn't need to do much when I created mine. It was a while ago. But um, Then you're going to go to support. You're going to go to Tech Exchange, and that's the one you got to remember. And when I go to Tech Exchange, is she thinking? Yep, she's thinking. It's going to come into your Tech Exchange, pick the appropriate version. Oops, sorry. That's weird. My screen's doing something weird. Pick your appropriate version you want to go to. Um, you can put in Siemens. You can do a search for all of them, uh, whatever you're doing, and then you know, you'll find it. Here you see the 2018 version. Um, from there, just download the zip file, and you're going to get the Tech Exchange doc, like I mentioned, and all the posts and all the files that I just showed you. All right. Um, yes, and I just got a um, validation from from Don, our post writer, extraordinaire, uh, and he did he did say correct. There is no miscellaneous value. To control the rotary axis locks. It's all driven from the post. All right, what else do we have here? Um, okay, here's a here's one. Can I post a three axis toolpath with the four axis post? Um, so certainly you can. Uh, nobody says I can't. In fact, I did uh, on this part, right? I happen to have you know bottom bottom toolpath feature that I was just doing some simple three axis toolpath on. Or maybe this is just a simple vice job. The only downfall is it's always going to output the fourth axis, right? So if I'm just working on a vice and my fourth axis is set aside, I'm probably going to see it at least spin to zero, and then I'm going to do everything on that base tool plane. Now, obviously, if you're disconnecting the fourth axis on your machine tool, which is pretty common, then you're going to run into a problem because it's still going to output the, the rotary commands. Um, so really, that's kind of the, the difference. If I if I need it to not output any fourth axis stuff, then I would really have to go back to the three axis post at this point. 
Um, to do, keep reading here. Um, will this post run my 808 control uh, that has a fourth axis? Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a valid, very valid question. So the 808 is very similar to the 828 and 840. So I would say the bulk of this toolpath will absolutely run in your in your control. Um, really, the big thing that you want to be careful with in the 808 is it's running a little different version of can cycle uh, when it gets to drilling. Um, that and the work offsets are a little different because we don't support the full expanded range work offsets, just G54 through 59. Um, but what I would suggest if you want to use this or even the three axis post for an 808 is you would have to um, not allow it to output the can drilling cycles because they will not work in the, in the 808 at this point. Um, so what you have to do, you can go actually inside of, um, there's just a, a couple options inside the um, control def editor, if memory serves me, and you can basically select whether or not you want the system to output can cycles. If you set that to a no and just let it output G1s and G0s for your drilling cycles, then uh, yeah, this should should certainly work in an 808. Um, trying to think that and the work coordinates. Oh, and you want to get rid of the workpiece blank. Workpiece blank didn't exist in the 808. Other than that, it should work. Okay, let's see what else we got. So if I run into any issues with the post, who should I contact? Um, so, so really the, the, the first line of defense is always going to be your master can reseller. Um, so I would say, you know, if, um, if you run into a problem, reach out to your reseller. Um, they should be able to steer you in the right direction as to whether or not there's a post issue or maybe you just need some support. But that's that's really always going to be step one. Uh, reach out to that reseller. Now, as far as getting the post, you can request it from the reseller or certainly you can go to the tech exchange just like I showed you. Okay. I think I got all the questions. This was some, some great questions. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to end our recording. I want to thank everybody again. Hold on one sec.